and the climate crisis. This event is part of our research network seminar series where we try and dig into the kind of technical, the, the, um, the research on, on basic income, obviously, and talk about how a basic income would affect or be affected by various intersecting issues. Um, and that, in fact, as the, the basic income conversation was the intention of the organization. We are hosted by Compass, the pressure group, uh, progressive politics pressure group. And uh, we started at the end of 2019 to, to try and increase conversation and debate about basic income in the UK. Um, we do that through various ways, a lot of engagement with civil society, both through organizations and uh, with our toolkit from the grassroots, from getting people, asking people to, to set up their own conversations with various people they think should be considering basic income. Uh, we do it, this work through the research network and also politically, uh, where we also work with Natalie through the CPPLG on basic income, uh, which is a political group, cross party and uh, various different levels of government because well, basic income has been championed at the sub, -na sub uh, national government uh, level so far. So important to make sure those lines of communication are open between, between various levels of government. So uh, this is, yes, the latest event in our, in our research network seminar series. You can find all of them on YouTube. We will be putting this event on YouTube too, so you can watch it back if you if you find any if you want to remember certain insights from this conversation or share it with other people you think that should be uh, paying attention to this conversation. Oh, thank you, Johnny, for linking to the CPPLG in the in the chat. You can find out a bit more about that there. Very good. Um, yeah, before I introduce well, before I let Natalie and uh, Samuel introduce themselves here. Um, do use the chat function throughout. You can talk about whatever you want in there. Ideally, on topic. <laughs> um, if you're gonna if you're gonna pose questions, though, best to use the Q and A function. Um, that'll be where we're pulling questions from. If you see questions that you want to have answered in the Q and A, do upvote them so we know that those particular pop, particularly popular ones. And uh, I am joined by my colleague Samuel from, from Compass tonight, who's helping out with, with the event. We're going to do it a little bit differently from previous Research Network events, and if you've been, been to one of these seminars before, and we're going to let you talk yourselves. I think I've done too much talking recently, too much uh, my own voice, so I'm going to let well, we welcome people to, to pose their own questions and comments if they want to. Um, if you're asking a question if you come on camera um you're, i mean you're very welcome to do it voice only and if you'd rather just have us read out the question let us know that but if you're if you're happy to come on camera that would be fantastic you will be recorded and that will go on the, the youtube uh, recording on the youtube <laughs> that will go on youtube uh, when we publish this video too so just be aware of that and if you're not comfortable with that then um we can read the question out but samuel did you want to say hello uh, yes, oh, yes, good evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's been actually really, really exciting to join this event and uh, and get this uh, particular conversation going. Um, I've um, I've just recently joined as the operations officer uh, at Compass, uh, so uh, I'm just here just to get stuck in with whatever work that needs to be done, as well as supporting Clea with the uh, basic income conversation, all the important work that she's doing. Um, I'm just here to, uh, to 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 be a support and also be an interesting listening ear. This is going to be a really great conversation. Mega excited. Um, as Cleo said, um, if you do have any questions, please bring them into the Q and A. Um, I'll be looking through that. And uh, what we hope to do is try to get uh, a lot more sort of deeper, more deeper seated sort of questions come from from the conversation. And we'll try to pick uh, fairly, but try to pick the, the right conversations that come from it. So upvote if you really want to hear Natalie um, answer all the ways of basic income and climate change. So it'd be great to uh, to do that. And uh, uh, thanks. Thank you. It was great to uh, say hi to everyone. Thank you, Samuel. Good to have you here. Very good to have you here, actually. <laughs> it's good to have a second set of hands on the event, as I've already said several times. Um, Fantastic. So without further ado, I think I'm going to pass over to our uh, wonderful speaker, Natalie. We'll let you introduce yourself. And then if you want to uh, crack on with your opening comments, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Cleo and Samuel. And it's lovely to be with everyone and to see that people aren't absolutely totally zoomed out yet. Uh, despite the uh, the 18 months or so that we've been through. Uh, I was saying before in the chat that last night I did my first hybrid talk where I had half the audience in the room and half at home on Zoom. And so I have a feeling that's the new age of something to look forward to. But tonight uh, we're all just sitting, well, I'm actually sitting in my office in the House of Lords. Um, uh, and I guess lots of people are probably sitting at home. Uh, 
couple of things about me. Um, so you don't have to sit there wondering the accent comes from Australia originally. Um, my first politics was feminism. Um, and one of the things I've written a bit about, and indeed I'll stick a link in the chat, is UBI as a feminist project. And I think it's really interesting if you look after the Second World War in the UK, um, there was actually a lot of women who championed what looked very like a universal basic income. And what we got as a welfare state was a real second class as they saw it, um, contributions based male focused approach. Uh, and as to why I'm a feminist, well, that's because when I was five, I was told because you're a girl, you're not allowed to have a bicycle. Uh, so that's how I became a feminist at age five. A uh, little bit of sort of professional stuff. Um, I'm unusual in politics. My first degree was agricultural science from a scientific background. Um, I then was a journalist for 20 years or so, finishing up as editor of the Guardian Weekly. I then was leader of the Green Party of England and Wales for four years from 2012 to 16. And in 2019, I came into the House of Lords and if you want to ask me what the House of Lords is like, the one word answer to that is strange, very strange. But it does give me the chance to do lots of ex interesting and exciting things. And um, I actually ran into Baroness Stedman Scott, who's our Department of Work and Pensions Minister in the corridor uh, before a debate last week. And she said, so I suppose you're going to ask about universal basic income then. So, um, uh, you know, I am quite known for raising it in the house quite often, particularly asking the government if they really, really thought about it. So that's the introduction. I, I guess I'll go Cleo in, into the, the presentation now, if that's what you'd like me to do. Okay, well, to start with where I really started on universal basic income, it was very much focused on the idea of um, security, um, particularly in the UK with low wages, zero hours contracts, um, swinging benefit sanctions, the idea that it would give people security, um, and of course security in a world that's fast changing in the climate emergency. We think about issues of food security, a lot of which we're talking about Brexit now, but it's actually also very you know, increasingly climate related. Um, security was really where I kind of started on the UBI journey. And it's probably useful to define what I mean by universal basic income. I mean a payment, a regular payment, going to every member of who's accepted, person who's a member, accepted as a member of a society um, to meet their basic needs. So I think it has to be set at a level sufficient to feed, clothe and house people. Um, I know that you get people right across the, the political spectrum advocating for what you might call um, a UBI, but I, I many years ago had the, the slight misfortune to uh, share a panel with the, the Adam Smith Institute. And there was they were what they called the UBI was a payment um, every week, a little bit of money so that then workers could be paid less by the employers. And that's not in my definition a UBI. It has to be enough that people are indeed able to refuse their labor. In a, in a comment on work, in workers' rights in the house quite recently, it was interesting that the clip from that did very well on social media. Um, acknowledging the power that UBI can potentially give workers. But I've actually moved um, in uh, the last year or so, perhaps, uh, and I presented a pay paper at the BN um, conference recently, at least putatively hosted in Glasgow, um, uh, talking about how I think we've actually undersold universal basic income, uh, that I think we really need to talk a great deal more about the freedom it gives people and the way in which it gives us the opportunity to actually really utilize human resources, talents, time and energy really well. So on the freedom point, um, to put it sort of in gross terms, if we think about um, under capitalism, you've got a boss who tells you how to spend your time, energy and talents. That determines a very large part of your life. If you take Socialism certainly has classically worked out in um, Eastern Europe and other places. Um, it was the state that told you how to spend most of your time, energy and talents and your basic subsistence, your income in both of those um, situations was determined by someone else. And that was how they controlled how you spent your time, energy and talents. Well, my proposition is that under a universal basic income society, uh, people, individuals, who I would argue are indeed the best placed to determine what the best use of their energy and talents is, um, are the ones who get to decide how to use them. 
and that that's the foundation of a very different sort of society. And I think in the context of the climate crisis, there's a couple of things to say about that. One of them is that um, we have now, and I've got a piece coming out in the next day or so in the Yorkshire Post along these lines, we're facing the climate emergency, the nature crisis, the essential collapse of our current economic system. Uh, what we have now is a society where we have also an aging population. Um, we have birth rates falling off a cliff and we have to go from the context in which my piece in the Yorkshire Post is written is of the uh, nuclear submarine deal between the US, the UK and Britain, which is being celebrated as creating lots of British jobs uh, in the, the context that I operate in. Um, and I was saying this is a really bad use of people's skills, talents and abilities when we face the climate emergency and the nature crisis. We have to be using, ensuring that people are able to use their skills and talents well. Um, and that human resource shortage, which we enormously face in the coming decades, um, we need to tackle the climate crisis and all of our other environmental and social ills. Um, if people are able to choose how to spend their time, my thesis would be that people are likely to choose to use it tackling the climate crisis rather than choose it uh, to um, put towards nuclear submarines, given the opportunity. The further thing I'd say is that actually, if people are using their skills and talents well, this is actually something that you're giving people a trade off. And one of the things I've also talked a lot about is the idea of a four day working week as standard with no loss of pay, perhaps eventually going down to a three day working week as standard. And with people having that freedom to choose to live differently and not be in a job if they want. Um, at the moment, we have a sort of trade off with people. And what we've actually seen certainly in the UK is people working more and more and getting more and more stuck. Um, the trade off with UBI is you get freedom and you get time and accompanying that is perhaps very likely less consumption of stuff. And so you know, if we're going to get to where we need to in terms of environment, um, we have to do that democratically. We have to take the voters, the people on side with us, show people that we're offering them a better way of life. And UBI is one of those better way of life, the freedom that UBI offers, the security that UBI offers, is actually a trade-off for less stuff in people's lives. And, you know, as I often say, you know, no one lies on their deathbed and goes, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. And with UBI, you can spend less time in the office, you can maybe not go to an office at all. Uh, and if you have less stuff in your life, maybe that's not such a difficult trade off, maybe it really looks very attractive to people. So there's that. And there's also one other area I want to want to raise um, before I, I draw these introductory remarks to a close. And that's going further into the skills point and our shortage of human resources. Our current education system, particularly in the UK, but broadly around the world is in a state of crisis. It's very much driven by teaching to the test, teaching for exam, and involves loading students down with enormous quantities of debt, um, most of which will never be paid back. Um, and again, it's more stress, more worry, huge problems of mental ill health. And our universities are in a profoundly dysfunctional state. I think if we start to think about what academe and indeed technical education, skills education might look like in a universal basic income society, is that um, scholars could use the universal basic income as a foundation and form cooperative enterprises, could even look out and go towards crowdfunding. And if you look at Patreon is a website where quite a lot of academics who I know who are doing quite alternative things and don't want to be trapped in, in the, the university system are actually funding their lives through crowdfunding, through community support on Patreon. I also know quite a lot of um, podcasters, and I've recently become a bit of a podcast addict, um, quite a lot of podcasters who've actually you know, taken their passion, their skills, their interests, turned them into a job that they've created for themselves as podcasters funded again by crowdfunding. And so I think in a universal basic income society, we can look towards academe developing into something very different. 
And something new to add that just came from the weekend actually was that um, I was at the How the Light Gets In Festival and I was at a talk, a really inspiring talk um, about a new startup project that's very much in its early stages, um, started particularly I think by a couple of academics from Cambridge University. And it's called the New School of the Anthropocene. And they're looking, they're hoping to take 16 students in the coming year um, with a much lower level of fees than is traditional and to build an entirely different idea of what a degree or a degree like qualification might look like and to build an entirely different kind of institution. So I think there's an enormous hunger out there in, in academia and indeed in, in technical education, in skills education um, to find different kind of models. And I think if you think about what could happen in a UBI society, there's huge possibilities there. And again, you know, this is called the new school of the Anthropocene, where they're coming from is pretty evident. Um, these could be tackling the hugely pressing problems that face us. And you know, to finish with, with, with a final thought um, is the Anthropocene, our current our climate crisis, nature crisis, our current social and economic crises were created by capitalism. You don't fix a problem with the system, the situation, the arrangements that broke it. Um, it's what we have now that broke the system, people being dictated to by a boss or dictated to by um, the state, um, setting the people, people free uh, to solve the climate crisis and all of our other pressing issues. That's what I see UBI is doing. Thanks very much. Thank you, Natalie, fantastic. Great to hear from you. Uh, Michael, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I apologize. I think I didn't give very good international instructions for time. I see my understanding of how time zones work is very poor. <laughs> but welcome. Um, do you want to, yeah. I was checking my email. Um, so I'm glad to be here. And sorry, I missed the uh, beginnings of uh, Natalie's remarks. But um, uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Michael Howard. I'm the uh, organizer of the um, U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network. I also am the co-editor of Basic Income Studies. I teach philosophy at the University of Maine, and I've been thinking about basic income for a couple of decades, and over the last decade, increasingly, the connection with uh, the climate, climate crisis. So just to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic income in the context of degrowth and the climate crisis more generally. Um, and I'll say a few things that I think probably most of the audience is, is pretty familiar with, but um, in order to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature rise, um, globally, we need to be reducing carbon dioxide emissions by around seven or eight percent per year. Um, and the IPCC carbon budget for just a 66 percent chance of staying below 1.5 degrees centigrade will be exhausted in 10 years at current emission levels. Uh, this is all the stress placed upon. The, the current decade is absolutely crucial, um, but global emissions are still rising. They're declining gradually in the United States and Europe, but they're rising in China and India. Um, and that carbon budget I mentioned, if you were to spread that over 30 years from now to mid-century, that comes down to about a little, over, a little under two tons of carbon dioxide per person annually. Globally, we're now emitting almost five. Uh, the United States is emitting on average 16 tons per person, eight times the budget per person globally. Uh, only India is at that 1.9. Um, and if you take into account equity, that is to say responsibility for past emissions, as well as ability to pay, Countries like the United States, their fair share of emissions ought to be considerably smaller than 1.9 uh, tons of CO2 per person, or uh, they ought to assume responsibility for the cost of emissions reductions elsewhere. Otherwise, we're giving an intolerable choice to developing countries. Um, so what does a 7% annual emissions reduction look like? Well, we've just been through 2020 which saw the largest reduction of CO2 ever recorded. And that was a 5.8% reduction in emissions, uh, about five times the decline uh, after the financial crisis of 2009. So the question I'm 
confronting is how do we do this without it feeling like austerity? Um, and I think basic income has a role to play in at least two ways. Um, in a small way, um, I think we need carbon pricing. We don't need this alone. We also need regulations. We need investments in alternative forms of energy. We need shutdowns of coal power plants and pipelines and a stop to new exploration. Uh, and there are two ways of pricing it. Uh, you can put a cap on carbon that's within the framework of that budget I was just mentioning. Um, and uh, a cap with an auction of permits and without any circuit breakers or phony offsets, um, that would be the clearest way to stay within the environmental limit. A carbon tax can achieve the same results if there's the political will to raise the price high enough. But either of these forms of carbon pricing face two hurdles. The first is the regressivity of a consumption tax. Uh, and secondly, there's the political backlash that can come with uh, putting prices on carbon fuel. The, the most dramatic illustration of this was the Gilets Jaunes protest in France. Um, and the way to address that is to take the revenue, or at least a big chunk of it, from the carbon pricing and distribute it as carbon dividends to everybody. And a majority of households will end up financially net gainers from such a policy. Um, this is, amounts to a kind of partial basic income. Uh, and in fact, if you, the carbon pricing goes up where it should, it's going to be in the range of something like the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend. So it's a significant amount, uh, but it's certainly not enough to uh, constitute a full basic income, which brings me to the second way that basic income can be relevant. Uh, and that is part of a, as part of a degrowth strategy. Um, and I'm not particularly fond of the term degrowth. Um, at a basic income conference in North America earlier in the year, somebody said, if we frame basic income in terms of degrowth, we are toast. Um, so it's tempting to stress the need for massive investments in solar and wind and so on, and the jobs these will create, because without these, reduction in growth alone will not stop carbon emissions. Um, maybe we should, rather than talk about degrowth, use James Boyce's phrase to grow the good and shrink the bad um, and de-emphasize de GDP as a measure of well-being. But I wonder if this doesn't dodge the hard question. And by that, I mean, is it possible to stay within safe ecological limits while maintaining current levels of economic growth? Economists will tell us that in principle, yes, if economic growth, that is to say the growth in abstract value can be absolutely decoupled from growth in energy and material throughput. Um, but for this to happen, the carbon intensity, uh, the carbon emissions intensity would have to decline faster, much faster than the rate of economic growth. On a world scale, this is not happening. Uh, and we only have a decade in which to do this. So we are toast if we don't adequately respond to the climate crisis. And some of the reasons for doubting whether green growth in GDP is possible is that if the demand for energy grows because of economic growth, green energy must not only replace fossil fuel, but it also has to grow to meet the new demand. And the energy cost of producing solar panels and wind turbines and so on, and replacing them when they wear out, will not leave enough energy for economic growth, according to some modeling by Peter Victor. Um, and then we have to deal with the rebound effect. If we simply um, introduce cheap green energy, this could in fact result in demand for more fossil fuels as when people's electricity costs go down and then they spend more money on transatlantic flights. Um, solar has grown 46 times uh, in the decade from 2008 to 2018, and yet it is still only 1% of energy use in the United States. Uh, and oil and gas consumption has continued to rise. Uh, and finally, I'll just say optimistic scenarios about reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050 are typically relying on heavy um, use of carbon removal, carbon capture and storage, 
um, which are technologies that are unproven at scale. And I would prefer to see us adopt the precautionary principle uh, and not rely on these possibly uh, technological fictions and continue to not face reality. So I conclude that the burden of proof is on advocates of green growth to show how this can be done. And if, the, if it can't be done, uh, we need to consider and elaborate what people often call degrowth policies. Uh, and I add as an important caveat, this applies particularly to the developed world. People in poor developing countries, they need to continue to grow. We need to help them to grow along a sustainable path. Um, so what are these policies? Very briefly, um, we should have more leisure and less production, uh, particularly where that production requires more energy and material throughput. Um, people will say, well, if you produce less, this means there will be higher unemployment. GDP stops or it goes in the negative direction, there'll be more and more unemployed people. The way to deal with that is to share the work and to have work time reduction. These have important co-benefits in terms of leisure time, health, uh, civic engagement, uh, care work, all that becomes the important things to do. We, we don't have enough time to do them now. Um, we should emphasize the positive benefits. We need a more egalitarian distribution of wealth and income. Um, a universal basic income can be funded by income from common wealth that we bring back into the commons or by higher marginal income tax rates and or by wealth taxes. Now, however we fund it, uh, a substantial basic income, more than you'd get from a carbon tax alone, would enable work time reduction. It would facilitate uh, more time for care work, participation in the autonomous sector, um, local agriculture, empowerment of workers and unions. Uh, Eric Olin Wright used to stress that a basic income can be viewed as a permanent strike fund and a source of capital for cooperatives and other alternative forms of, um, of economic activity. And as we move toward greater equality, there will be less need for positional goods, the kinds of goods that people need because other people have them. And if there are fewer positional goods, then this powering down will feel less like austerity. Um, I think this is a very hard sell politically, but reason and necessity are on our side. Reason because we're appealing to what it is to live well, both for our bodies and our minds. And necessity because we're acknowledging what we must do to sustain a habitable planet for ourselves, for future generations, and for the other species with which we share the planet. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, do you mind uh, if I ask uh, for degrowth? Would you mind defining that term uh, just so people who might be unfamiliar with the, with the idea of it? Yeah, the idea is that you, uh, rather than you set as a, um, a target for economic uh, policy that the gross domestic product should increase by a certain amount, year to year in order to increase employment and increase wealth, uh, that you should set it at zero or maybe less than zero because um, all this economic activity is, is generating uh, carbon emissions, a larger carbon footprint um, and uh, a larger environmental footprint more generally. Thank you. Natalie, did you wanna add something to that? Oh, just to say that I tend not to talk a lot about degrowth. What I tend to talk about a lot is actually managing the economy for the well-being of people and planet. And for example, um, New Zealand is, is, is the great case study of this at the moment. Um, the treasury is guided there by the living standards framework, uh, which actually looks at you know, everything from child poverty to the state of nature, to all of those things you say, you know, why, what are we aiming to achieve? And that's what the treasury is aiming for. Yeah, the nature of GDP is, is an economic measure. You know, the, the famous example is you cut down a forest um, and GDP goes up because you sell the timber, but you don't count the loss of the lost forest. Um, and it's a nonsense measure. And I think it's, it's kind of dangerous and not terribly helpful to focus on that measure, which is nonsense anyway. I rather prefer that this living standards framework, well-being economy kind of approach. And I will put it a little advert here at the moment because there's a petition with about 60,000 signatures uh, in the UK 
um, on a wellbeing petition um, that could force a parliamentary debate. And I'm going to stick a link in the chat for anyone from the UK who feels like signing it. Great time. Let's do some practical action while we do the discussion too. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, brilliant. So I'm going to ask a few of my own questions for the next 10, 10 or so minutes, and then um, and then we'll open up the floor to the attendees, participants. Um, do pop your questions in the Q and A, and even if you have you know if you have a comment that you it's not necessarily a question, try and frame it as a question so we can do responses. But um, if it is just a comment, pop that into the Q and A box too, and we'll start calling on people in, in sort of 10, 10 or so minutes. Um, Natalie, you said your background's in agriculture. I'd be really interested to hear how you think basic income, I mean, agriculture feels like a, a sector or a, um, yeah, that, that is going through a lot of change at the moment and, you know, that's so deeply intrinsically linked to climate and, and climate change. How do you think basic income, you know, is there a sense of how people in agricultural field feel about basic income, if we asked? Uh, or, yeah, how do we think it would affect it? Um, I think it's probably not something that most people currently in agriculture, which is a very capitalistic, um, very centralised, you know, lots of factory farming kind of environment have um, engaged with much. It starts rather more from the grassroots in terms of indeed this piece in The Guardian today, which I'll dig up and post again in the chat in a second, um, about the great growth of community gardens. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about in looking at our broken food system, this applies particularly to the UK and the US, is that... Um, well, we should be eating, um, you will have heard of five a day fruit and vegetables. Actually, that's what the sociologists came up with. The nutritionists tell us it should be 10 a day. Um, and when the nutritionists said that to the sociologists, they said, given people are basically eating two, we set them a target of 10, everyone will give up. So that's why we have a target of five. So we need to be growing vastly more fruit and vegetables. And one of the ways to do that in a climate sensitive way, and also a poverty sensitive, socially sensitive um, indeed catering, supporting biodiversity way, is local urban food production community gardens. And this piece from The Guardian talks about how they've grown enormously and COVID has, has perhaps given them a, a large impetus as well. But people are really, you know, doing that. And indeed, one of my favourite lines is, you know, um, if you decide you want to live on UBI and run your local community garden, um, then UBI makes that possible. And, you know, that's something everyone who I've ever met, and I, I tend to meet quite a lot of community gardeners. It's one of the, the things when you're, when I was Green Party leader, you know, you go and visit a town, you go and visit the community garden. Um, and, you know, they're usually very happy, very healthy looking people who are clearly having a great time. And so, you know, we talk about shifting food production. You know, our current food system is very clearly broken. And interestingly, in the UK, um, you know, Dimble, the Dimbleby report, which was just recently out, said that very clearly. Sadly, the government's initial reaction was more or less to throw it in the bin. But nonetheless, producing fruit and vegetables, small scale, local, all of these things fit extraordinarily well with UBI. And, you know, it also starts to tie into issues like land reform and access to land and lots of other issues as well. But a UBI can be a real foundation for a different kind of food system, a different kind of, of diet, which we desperately need. Absolutely. I always feel like you know, we, we're robbed of our chance to put our hands in the soil and our feet in the soil. And uh, from when we talk about well-being, it's, uh, I think, an important thing. And the margins of profit are so low for people who are doing small scale farming that it's basically, you know, there's no business model. But, you know, it seems like a similar ridiculous thing to assess whether it's productive labour by whether you're making a profit from it or not when you're growing food <laughs> with something so base. Uh, Michael, did you have anything you wanted to add on the agricultural side of things? Any, any interesting um, things there? Maybe just connect it to a, a kind of broader context, which is that um, one thing that basic income can do is help to broaden the conversation about what is meaningful work. Uh, we tend to think of work as paid employment. Uh, and then if you don't have it, you're completely cut out of the economy, you're poor. Uh, but if everybody has uh, a base of income on which they can do other things, uh, what Natalie was just talking about is one example, um, but there are others as well, care work and civic activity, other kinds of participation. Um, it makes it possible. And we have to recognize that these are things that are not only um, useful and valuable, but the market economy can't exist without them. Uh, Childcare, I mean, unless we raise children, there are no workers. Uh, and yet, you know, we put all of our emphasis on getting people into paid employment. 
Um, I think we need to broaden the conversation about what counts as work. Uh, and then basic income will be something that people are willing to embrace and, um, and then try to steer this um, in the direction of activity that is um, environmentally sustainable. If I can just bounce off that, um, I mean, I, I draw a lot of my thinking on this, both from David Graeber, Bullshit Jobs, um, but also um, from a visit to Gal Gale, a wonderful community um, project in Glasgow. Um, and it really crystallised something I've been thinking. Someone there said to me, you know, this is a very poor community. Um, everyone will tell us, oh, we've got a shortage of jobs and well-paid jobs. But we have absolutely no shortage of things that need to be done for our community to be done in our community. And if people are able to choose how to spend their time, as I was talking about, then they're going to identify the things that most need doing. Many of those, you know, may never be paid jobs. Some of them we've seen lost with austerity. They were paid jobs previously. And, you, you know, there's a debate to be had about which you want to restore as jobs and which you want to keep as voluntary effort. Um, but certainly, you know, going and having a cup of tea with, with, with a lonely neighbour and just having, a, you know, a tea and a chat um, is not something that, you know, is ever going to be a paid job. Um, but it's something that so much in our society desperately needs. You know, you look at the so-called loneliness um, epidemic. Um, you know, UBI is a real potential um, reaction, sort of partial solution to that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Yeah, amazing, amazing place. Oh, beautiful. Um, the so, I mean, I think on the climate uh, link to basic income, I think it's often very spec. I think it's very difficult because these are both things that kind of are happening, but we're not measuring very effectively or we're not engaging with very effectively um, in terms of how we reduce carbon emissions, how we negate um, climate change and how we implement a basic income and what the impacts of it actually would be. I'm interested to hear both what we think the route to a basic income uh, negating climate change would be like, uh, and you know, what are the risks there? Is it is it surefire? It's definitely going to go that way, or is there a risk that it is going to continue to increase consumption? Um, and then the the flip side being, how do we? What do we need to do alongside a basic income to ensure that it becomes something that um, that positively or negatively impacts climate change, but positively impacts climate? Two sides. Um, I could speak to that. Um, you know, there is a, a, a problem when you distribute income uh, from people who tend to save more of it, the wealthy, to the poor, there's going to be more spending. And that could well boost carbon emissions. Uh, so part of it depends on how are you funding it. And if part of the funding is coming from putting prices on carbon, and that should much more uh, reduce carbon emissions than the additional spending would raise them. So that's one, one partial answer to that. And I think what, what you also have to do is um, you don't want basic income to solve the climate crisis on its own. Uh, it's going to have to be in tandem with other policies, with educational measures, you know, you don't just give people money and then hope that they will make wise decisions. You want to have uh, democratic conversations, put in place um, incentives to spend their money in positive ways rather than negative ways. For example, you give pe people a, a basic income grant uh, and they might buy a new, um, you know, coal-fired furnace for their house. But if you also have in place incentives to put up solar panels, instead of you know, a coal-fired furnace, uh, then it's going to have a positive rather than a negative outcome. I think perhaps to add to that, I mean, it's worth saying that most models of, of universal basic income, uh, the cohorts that they increase the, their actual income with are the, the lowest, very lowest levels of cohorts. Um, and you know, the, the bottom 20, perhaps 30% of income by income now and those people who are those are people who actually need to um, increase their consumption. You know, certainly in the UK and I guess in the US too. You know, there are people who shift, switch the heating off in winter and shiver because they can't afford the bills. People who skip meals because they can't afford to eat. 
I saw a figure uh, just a week or so back from the US that said, you know, in the previous week of the study being conducted, 80% of people had not eaten food when they wanted it because they couldn't afford it. You know, that's, that's a definition of a failed economic system to my mind. Um, and so it lifts the income of, of those cohorts at that kind of level. But all of the, the models of UBI that I'd certainly advocate, it doesn't mean that people that, you know, certainly above, say, the 50% level have actually any extra income. Now, they're the people who spend a lot now. You're not giving, who, who consume a lot of resources now. You're not giving them any more, more income. So, I mean, this also addresses the question that's often put up of, you know, wouldn't it result in inflation? Is, is you, you might see, I think, perhaps, you know, a small readjustment, some of the very cheapest areas of the country, say, for rents. Um, you might see a bit more of rebalancing. You know, some people might take their UBI and choose to go and move to, very, to areas of the country where rents are very low because then it would be easier to live. Uh, but if you do that, then, you know, what you're actually doing, which is certainly something that's very of great interest in the UK, is, you know, helping to, government talks about levelling out, I prefer to think about spreading out of prosperity. So you get some kind of regional rebalancing, potentially. So the economic effects, you know, are not enormous, I think, on a macroeconomic level. Um, you do get some regional readjustments, but it certainly doesn't mean that people suddenly have a heap more money to spend on, you know, extra toys for the kids or, you know, cranking up the heating in the house or those sorts of things. Agreed, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and in a similar vein, what rate of basic income do we think, uh, yeah, what rate do you think a basic income needs to be set at for it to allow people to have a bit of a, uh, you know, move towards this different lifestyle that you've talked about? What is it, the UBI Society lifestyle, Natalie? And, and does it need to be a full basic income? Does it, would a low basic income allow for this like level of behavior change, do you think? Well, you, if, since you addressed that to me, I'll start. Um, I mean, I'm not in favour of a very low level of basic income. You know, talks of, uh, and I can see, you know, people say sometimes, well, this is a start and it gives people something. But I think, you know, if you're still forcing people to walk, work um, or to, you know, apply for complex conditional benefits, then you're not really getting, you know, the gain is very, very marginal it has to be enough to meet people's basic needs. Now, what the Green Party went into the last general election in 2019 in the UK on was £89 a week, um, which is a bit of an uplift from essentially job seekers allowance. Um, we'd like to have set it higher, but we had a fully costed manifesto, so we had to make it all add up and come together. And just to also partly answer a question that was, I think Poppy posted in the, in the chat, um, we still keep, and, and certainly every, serious model of, of universal basic income that I've seen, um, keeps uh, extra payments for disabled people in particular, because that's a reflection of the fact that our societies are discriminatory, that they do discriminate against disabled people, whether it's you know, lack of access to public transport or our other facilities, um, whether it's the way employers treat them. And so payments to cover the extra costs of disability absolutely have to remain. Um, Universal basic income in, in my model, you know, goes to someone as soon as they're born. So that helps parents. But we also maintain a payment for single parents, acknowledging the fact, again, that our society is discriminatory, doesn't provide the childcare people need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, £89 a week is not a lot, but the assumption is that that's for people of working age. Um, we had, had a pension um, that once you reach pension age, um, ensure that no pensioner lived in poverty. I think from recollection, it was £189 a week. Um, so the assumption is that most people on that £89 will do still do some work. We also kept housing benefit because the practical reality of the UK is there's such a huge difference in cost of housing between some parts of the country and other parts of the country that it's impossible to have a general figure you know, in an ideal world where we've got much more social housing, you get a total rebalancing. Eventually, you bring housing benefit into the UBI. But we had to keep housing costs separately just because of where we're starting from in the UK. Um, so that was where we were at. And you know, most people then, you know, if you choose to do a few extra hours a week, you know, do your podcast and get a bit of crowdfunding for your extra money from, from, from a podcast, you know, that's with going to give people you know, a chance to live at a basic, le decent level. Um, and that's that's a foundational start. Just Absolutely. No, Michael, yeah, please. 
I agree with any, everything that Natalie just said and um, add that um, it's, it's difficult to specify a threshold above which everybody is free to say no to work because people's needs vary so much. But I think even, even at a relatively low level, uh, you do see some uh, liberation coming from uh, relatively low levels of payment. In Alaska, for example, uh, the annual dividend is typically under $2,000 per person. Uh, but studies of the labor market in Alaska have found that some people do work less just because they receive the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend. Other people, interestingly, work more uh, because the, the payment is enabling. And it also increases employment because um, with people spending the money they receive from the dividend, it creates jobs in the local community. It could be uh, jobs that people create for themselves, like you know, community garden work that they're doing. Um, so uh, I think there's probably a kind of continuous effect. The higher you set it, the more it enables people to think of alternative ways of living their lives than being in paid employment. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think particularly in the UK, the way that our benefit system is currently set up, you're actively disincentivized to do work uh, if you want to, if you need to have any kind of alternative form of income that doesn't come directly from uh, from a job, which doesn't really help with, with the idea of doing productive, meaningful or enriching work. Um, fantastic. Right. So we're going to start taking some questions from, from participants, from people other than me just now. Samuel, did you have any... Uh, Anyone you wanted to invite to, to yeah. ask that question? So we've had um, a fantastic conversation. We've had a, some really, really good questions. A lot of it is, uh, it's really kind of orientated towards the family, towards monetary policy. Um, and, and both Michael and Natalie both kind of touched in certain facets of it. But we're gonna go from the sort of voted in sort of questions in. Um, Marilyn Howard's got the highest one so far. I don't know, Marilyn, if you would like to speak at all, if you wanna uh, raise your question or do you want me to answer it for you? We pop, pop a yes or no in the chat, Marilyn, yeah. if, you're, if you're around, that'd be great. trying a new approach today so we'll yeah. see i'm not sure i can see marilyn's name still on the list might be a really out job <laughs> oh that's how it, oh. That's it is. okay i'll i'll do that so her top question was uh to to the panel if ubi means there's more time to provide care how can we ensure that it isn't just women doing this I think um, the uh, comment piece that I put in the chat addresses this at some length, but um, just to sort of fairly briefly say, um, and I think this reflects something that Michael said, is that UBI is not a panacea. Um, you, anyone who tells you, I would say that any single policy prescription, someone who says this is a solution to everything, you should immediately be extraordinarily skeptical about everything they're saying. Um, UBI is, you know, creates lots of possibilities it does change the whole framework, but it doesn't mean it fixes everything, particularly including gender relations. Um, and so, you know, you would also need to see the same kind of policies, you know, equal pay policies, you would need to see anti-discrimination policies, you would quite possibly need to see quotas, all kinds of other policies that would, you know, are not directly related to UBI, um, but there's lots of other things to fix in society and UBI just doesn't magically fix everything. Um, and, you know, panaceas just don't exist, essentially. Michael, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah. I could just add quickly, I mean, one thing you could do is to have um, mandatory parental leave when a child is born, especially for the early stages. So it's not just women taking time off, but the men have to take time off to be participating in the childcare. So things like that could be uh, complementing a basic income. I mean, the Scandinavians have that. I think it was certainly Sweden and some of the other states as well, that um, a third of the um, care has to, the leave time has to be taken by the parent who's not taking the main period of time. And if you don't take it, you lose it. Um, and, and indeed that's also Green Party policy um, in the UK copying that model. 
Um, and there's lots of evidence that that actually you know, is very good for both parents and children in terms of long term mental health and all kinds of other issues. Thank you both. Samuel, who's our next? Yeah, um, I've got the, the next one. Um... Oh, your sounds just cut out. Like to uh, uh, come in and uh, and and raise your question, or if you if you want, I can raise it for you. Yeah, you did have two. Uh, so it's uh, the one uh, regarding uh, additional needs for people, um, uh, with el the elderly payments people who are disabled. I don't know if you want to come in on that. One. Yes, I'm. Um, I'm nearly seventy, so eventually my needs will become more and. Um, Next door, I have a friend who's a single parent with a teenage son with very severe cerebral palsy. Obviously, our needs are different than to somebody who's going out to work and is young and fit and able. And actually, I do think Natalie has mostly answered the question earlier on. And will, will universal ba basic income vary according to people's needs? Well, I, th I think sort of addressing on what I said before, you know, I, before for anyone who missed it, I said you know, disabled people should get extra payments because our society is discriminatory. Um, the children, as soon as they're born, get a universal basic income, but single parents obviously have extra needs because of, again, the, the financial, because of the discriminatory nature of our society. So yes, to more for single parents. Um, but also, I think this ties in with, with, with a question that was floating around in the chat um, and that I also put a, a, um, a link in to. Um, you know, universal basic income, I don't see as in any way contradictory to or in opposition to universal services. Um, and, you know, I would include services being um, childcare, uh, social care, uh, which is free in Scotland, incidentally, in the UK context, but not in England. Um, uh, so, you know, an older person who was ill should be getting the, the support they need from services rather than necessarily a payment. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a disabled child or a parent of a disabled child or a disabled adult should be getting payment to reflect the extra costs applied to them because of their disability, because of our society. Um, so it's not, I think, I think it's really important to keep the UBI at a standard level, something that goes to everyone. That's the basic standard. There's no conditionality but you put in extra payments then for special circumstances rather than seeing it as adjusting the UBI. And I think there's an important principle there because you know, in the UK context, universal credit is such a disaster because of extreme conditionality. And we're seeing another case study of that in the UK with the disappearance of the free television license for the over 75s. And as soon as you apply conditionality, there's extreme unfairness arises. So the conditionality shouldn't be attached to the UBI to my mind. Thank you. Michael, do you have any thoughts on how this should be structured around additional needs? And, and I would just second what, what Natalie said on this. Um, that would be my answer. I, I agree that um, often we see this uh, polar opposition between universal basic income and universal basic services. And I think they should be thought of as complementary. In fact, a question that I often raise when that debate occurs is, does the advocate of universal basic services think that we can dispense with all cash payments and turn them into services? Um, and usually the answer is no. And then the question is, okay, for the cash transfers, do we want to maintain all the old conditionalities or do we want to um, turn them into unconditional payments? And I've not really heard an answer to that question from the advocates of universal basic services. I have actually heard some advocates of universal services suggest that the state should supply everyone with food as well. And quite frankly, I found that such a horrifying concept that I had to pick myself up off the floor before I argued against it, because um, you know, that is, to my mind, an incredibly statist um, and very disturbing model. And when pushed, they also said, well, richer people can buy different food. And that looked like my idea of hell, to be honest. I think there's a fine balance between investment in certain sectors or, you know, and, and turning something into a service or replacing with a cash payment. You know, these things all need to be very finely tuned and, and 
balanced amongst each other. And I think that's why the universal framing, I find, doesn't necessarily enhance the argument for increased service provision. I think services are fantastic and, you know, should, should be maximized and as fit for purpose as possible. But, you know, universal basic income is universal for a very specific reason. I think universal services are much harder to, uh, to uh, define. Samuel, we had a question from Sean. Did you want to pose that? Yes, yes. Uh, I wonder, uh, Sean, if, if you would like to come in uh, uh, and answer your question. I think he said he was happy for us. Maybe, or maybe just in the chat. Um, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. we can. All good. Okay. Um, just briefly, um, I'm interested in how the modern monetary theorists um, uh, the, the plurality of them, if it was, um, you know, if it could pay for UBI, that's all good. But what are the barriers and why uh, are there the um, different viewpoints on, 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 on UBI from the modern monetary theorists? Why do some theorists agree it could pay for UBI? And some not pay for UBI and pay for a job or guarantee instead, you know, if you follow my question. Um, I'll have to just beg off on this question because I don't know mon modern monetary theory well enough to represent it or to uh, advocate for or against it. So we, we need a different panelist than me for that question. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to put myself forward as an expert of, of modern monetary theory, but um, there is underlying it a, a basic understanding, which I think is very important. Um, and that's that um, a national budget is not like a household budget. And this is something that in the UK dates back to Margaret Thatcher and the, the idea, that, and indeed, you know, a certain Labour um, minister who unfortunately in 2010, when he was leaving office, left a note saying there's no money left which has been used by the Conservatives ever since. Um, the fact is that, um, you know, money, many years ago, I was a volunteer at the um, at British Museum in the Money Gallery. And um, it was interesting that when, the, when they were training us to do this volunteer job, the, um, we were told that they'd been going to stick, you know, as you would expect on, on when they redesigned the gallery, put up on the wall, a definition of what is money. Um, and there wasn't a definition of what is money up on the wall because they realized they simply couldn't boil it down to a sentence. And money is you know, whatever people decide to accept it as and whatever people create it as. And interestingly, this actually goes back to Cleopatra, the famous one in ancient Egypt. And she was the first person to um, create token money, um, whereby she said, this coin is worth a certain amount because I say it is not because of the value of the precious metal in the coin um, and ever since we've simply been declaring things to be money and things to have value because um, they've declared it so I'm not going to outline a modern monetary theory but basically it's saying that the idea that the state depends on income depends on um, when it can simply create its own money um, it depends on you know the taxes coming in having to match spending going out is an absolute nonsense, which demonstrably it is. If you look at the two um, recent case studies of the financial crisis uh, of 2007, 2008, and the COVID crisis, in both cases, states have essentially, at least metaphorically, printed lots of money, uh, created lots of money. And that's kind of the, the challenge to that traditional view of, of the whole thing is, is a money in, money out, is kind of the foundation of M MMT. Um, my personal view on the basic job guarantee is I'm very, very strongly against it. Again, for the same reasons that I was talking about in terms of uh, the state supplying people with food. Um, it's the absolute opposite of the kind of freedom that I was positing that UBI gives us. Um, you still have the state defining what a job is, what a worthwhile occupation is, and saying everyone has to be in a job. It's conditionality again, and it's a potentially an extremely controlling conditionality. If you decide you want to run a community garden and the state thinks your area doesn't need a community garden, then you haven't got a job. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very opposed to that idea. And it's something I've had quite a few, um, you know, lively discussions on over the years. Thank you. Just, Sorry, you carry on. Add on that topic. Uh, 
we had a debate on job guarantees versus basic income a decade or so ago in the United States. And uh, my position on that was there are lots of public goods that are in need of being provided and for which we need to create jobs. And so I have no objection to jobs programs that create jobs that supply public goods, but just to create jobs for the sake of keeping people busy is what Philippe von Parijs has called work fetishism. And I think we need to, to criticize it. And I'll just add on that, the monetary theory. Uh, some of you may know Scott Santens, who is a um, very popular publicizer of basic income in the United States. And he just recently uh, posted a, a blog post on modern monetary theory and basic income. So people could look that up. That uh, it's, a, it's not very technical, but he did spend the last eight months researching the topic. So I think it would probably be a pretty good answer to the question that was posed. Thank you. I was going to just make a joke about we went from modern monetary theory to ancient Egyptian monetary theory, which is quite good. <laughs> Samuel, do we have another question coming? Yes, we do. Um, we've got quite a few um, and I kind of wanted to try and make sure we're trying to keep this uh, as fairly orderly as possible. We had Abram, uh, Reinhard and, and Rose, um, but um, Abram has asked me to, to raise it on his behalf and Reinhard and Rosa hopefully will be able to come and join in. But Abram's uh, question was, uh, it's a little bit wordy, so please forgive me. He says, what are the indicators that suggest the typical person would make more environmentally conscious decisions if they received a basic income? I have no doubt that green thinking individuals would be empowered to pursue sustainable behaviours and activities, but surely education will need to play a significant role for people to change their worldview. So I wonder if anybody wants to dip in on that one. I don't know that there are any indicators that just receiving a basic income would lead somebody to behave in a more ecological way. I think that's why, uh, as we've said before, that you need to pair basic income with lots of other policies and certainly education about um, education in terms of personal consumption, education in terms of um, local policy and national policy, um, Without those complementary policies, basic income would just be moving the money around. I would say that I think it's there's quite a lot of evidence that a lot of consumption now is driven by people's insecurity. Um, in the UK, and I, I would guess in the US too, um, people don't trust the pension system. People know that the state pension is nothing like adequate to meet your needs. So one of the very traditional things to do is to try and buy a bigger house so that when you do retire, you can downsize and the house operates as like a pension. Um, or maybe, you know, you save really hard and scrimp to buy a rental house and that gives you extra income. Um, and, you know, in more kind of um, lifestyle terms, uh, many people feel horribly insecure in their jobs and they fear you know, we have a very steep ladder. And if you start sliding down the, the professional employment ladder, people fear tumbling off the bottom and there's no cushion there. And so you know, people feel like lots of, you know, the, the toughest workplaces, you have to be seen as a really go ahead, striving kind of person who's, who's you know, going to make it to the executive suite. Uh, and to do that, you know, you always need to be wearing the latest fashions. What's this month's colour? Um, Instagram tells you, see people say, I don't, I don't know this personally, but I'm told this is the case. Um, you know, you want to be leaning on the water cooler casually dropping into the conversation that, well, you know, when I was in Dubai for that long weekend, um, you know, this happened. And those are things that mark you out as go ahead, go getter. And people feel like they have to do that. And they have to chase things that give them security to store up money for security because they don't have that foundational security. So I think that's always been one of the sort of green arguments about UBI. Um, but I think also, it, you know, it's not the complete solution by any means. And one of the issues is that what we need to see, I would say, is to see products having on their price tag the real cost of them. And so that means, you know, if you go to Primark and buy a five pound T-shirt and you look at all the externalised environmental social costs for that T-shirt, it's actually costing far more than five pounds. But one of the problems now is, you know, lots of people go and buy that five pound T-shirt because they've got a job interview on Monday, they needed a crisp white T-shirt 
um, and they've only got five pounds in their pocket. So you've got to actually ensure that people have enough money to pay the fair price for things. Um, and that so UDI, UBI then allows you to price in those externalized costs that we now all pay. And so it's it's part, it's not whole, you've got to put those costs in as well, but it's part of ensuring that you, you balance this up. And I think if I can, this ties in with another question, sorry, I've forgotten who asked it now, um, but the question about funding it from um, potentially from, from carbon taxes or similar. And I think the 2019 Green Party manifesto in the UK or England and Wales um, was focused on, um, it was in the context of the Gilets Jeunes protests in France, which had risen in part after um, Macron brought in carbon taxes. And so what we actually did was brought in a very large carbon tax over a 10 year period and used a significant amount of that for funding UBI. And I think there's very much you know, an argument there for saying, you know, there is a problem if you just bring in carbon taxes when so many people are struggling and you know, French rural people said, said quite fairly, well, you've, you've, you've closed out all of our buses. We have no choice but to drive a car to get to work. And now you're making that more expensive. Um, so you know, this is all part of that package and combining environmental measures with funding UBI, I think makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, I think on the um, indicators thing, it's, you have to kind of couple it with other indicators that we can currently measure in the current world. So, you know, uh, I guess lower earners having to spend money on poorer quality goods that are then more wasteful. But if you don't earn enough, or you don't have enough disposable income to buy, uh, you know, a pair of shoes that's going to last you a couple of years, then you're going to buy the pair of shoes that last you a couple of weeks and, and then have to do it again in a few weeks. But if you don't have enough money, yeah. Yeah. Um, Samuel, do we have a next question coming? Indeed we do. Uh, so I wanted to uh, have Reinhardt, Rose and Ken, um, but Reinhardt, do, would you like to speak at all? I can try, can you hear me? My internet is a bit unstable. We can yeah? hear you yeah. Okay, uh, I actually raised two questions, but one got more votes. So I suppose you allow me to ask this question. Um, so I'm Reinhard from Leeds, a uh, supporter of UBI Lab uh, Network and UBI Lab Leeds. Um, my question is actually um, this issue about UBI and consumerism. When I discuss basic income with people, then uh, they say, yes, it will just promote consumerism. Billionaires are in favor of basic income because they want to keep people quiet and uh, they want to make the political decisions and just keep everybody happy with the basic income. Uh, it was partially already discussed, but I mean, I would like to get the opinion of the two speakers because uh, what I understood, okay, we need also education. So should basic income wait until people have been educated about our economic and political system and that uh, consum consumerism is not the answer to their life? Thank you. Well, I think to, to come in, first of all, the, um, the billionaires who are, who are advocating or running experiments, et cetera, on, on basic income, um, I think most of them, certainly the ones I'm aware of, are all tech people, and they're very often coming from a perspective of saying, oh, well, AI, well, AI, artificial intelligence is going to take away the jobs, and therefore we're going to have to, you know, give people this, this security so that we can, you know, get the robots and the artificial intelligence doing everything instead of jobs. Um, now, one of the things, I won't go into the depths of this, but I actually wrote a, a thesis on artificial intelligence 20 years ago, and... It was almost there then, 20 years ago, we were almost getting AI working. I, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic about any idea of deep AI. We have big data now and big data is doing certain things, but it's not artificial intelligence. We're nowhere near artificial intelligence and we're unlikely to be near anytime soon. And interestingly, actually just last week, there was a study out um, really quite debunking an awful lot of claims about medical artificial intelligence, which showed that um, testing on um, mammograms um, that AI, even now, a very, what's seen as a very developed area, was produced poorer results than did doctors, um, which I think was a very interesting and probably very important study. Um, so there's that to say about AI, but also the deeper point I'd make is that AI is not inevitably going to take over jobs, even if it gets to what its proponents propose. Um, we have a choice about 
just because we have a technology doesn't mean we choose to deploy it. We have a choice about the kind of society we have. And, and coming back to the point about agriculture, um, every time I go to the, the uh, Oxford Real Farming Conference and other farming conferences, there's always someone saying, what we do is we have all of these robots, tiny robots buzzing around the fields, applying um, fertilizer and, uh, and pesticides to plants. And you know the, the, the fields are just covered with these robots rubbing, you know, buzzing around. And, you know, Aside from environmental resources, you know, capacity to do that, is that actually what we want to get, how we want to grow our food? Is that the best way to grow our food? Can we choose not to grow our food, even if that is technically possible? Uh, these things are choices. And I would say the tech billionaires are very much promoting their own interests in that very direct kind of way with their, their supporting something like basic income. I also share uh, Natalie's skepticism about um, robots and AI eliminating work. Um, the economies that are industrializing with, or eliminating employment through automa automation are not eliminating jobs, they're just creating different jobs. Often they're worse jobs. So I prefer to put the stress on precarious employment rather than the elimination of jobs. And a lot of the precarity of work has to do with the decline of unions, um, outsourcing of work. Um, workers just don't have the kinds of bargaining power they have that they used to have in employment. Um, and basic income can restore some of that bargaining power, which in the context of talking about the transition to a fossil free economy um, can be a demand for different kinds of work than we've seen in the past. Um, so what the, the uh, entrepreneurs are advocating, I think they would probably not be on board for large wealth taxes and taxes on uh, the intellectual property rights that they reap so much money from, which should really be going into the commons. Uh, they've taken their cut for coming up with a new invention, but it shouldn't extend out into the indefinite future. It should. Uh, fold back into the commons uh, and become a source of uh, funding for a basic income. And then the basic income can be more substantial than just a kind of palliative for losing your job. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I think it's because it's universal, it, almost, it should or uh, yeah, it, it could or should benefit people in work more than people out of work because that's the majority and so that should be the design I, I believe. Samuel do we have someone come in with another question? Yes we do uh, so the the next upcoming two questions uh, Rose uh, raised a, a quite a good question she asked me to just say it um, out, out loud so uh, Rose's question was 89 pounds I think that might be Samuel's end is that Samuel's end or my end? I'll, I'll read it out. Yeah, well, oh, can you hear me okay? You're back now. Do you want to try again? Back. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that, guys. Um, my internet's a little bit um, uh, funky. So um, uh, she she basically said eighty nine pounds a week. It's four thousand six hundred twenty eight a year, but the average salary is within the twenty five thirty thousand k mark. So UBI is not sufficient to refuse work. It would have to be so much more. So how can you convince people politically that that's a good idea? Since that's UK focused, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I mean, the median salary is about 24, last figure I saw was about 24,000 pounds a year, I think. Um, you know, a lot of people actually live on not much more than that. Job seekers is, I think these were 2019 figures, although I doubt they've changed much. Um, job seekers was 80 pounds a week. So there are actually significant numbers of people living on that. As I said, you know, we'd like to set that figure higher, but we had a fully costed manifesto. So we actually had to show exactly everywhere where the money came from. Um, and we saw this as a start, as a way of giving people, you know, if you're unemployed, you would still be better off. At that also, of course, remember that housing benefit was on top of that, um, payments for single parents, payments for um, disabled people. So that's the absolute foundational level. Um, I'd like it to be more, but I think lots of people do actually live on that kind of sum of money, um, you know, particularly if they've got housing benefit as well. Uh, 
so that's where we're starting from with the aim of lifting it up higher. And I think, you know, um, so many people now, I, I made mention of uh, Graeber's bullshit jobs. You know, work makes lots of people deeply unhappy, makes lots of people ill, makes lots of people extremely dissatisfied. And if you choose to drop your standard of living, but do what you really want to do, and whether that's, you know, compose music, paint pictures, do poetry, um, start that small business you've always thought was the most brilliant idea. But if you're, say, a single mum with a couple of kids, it's incredibly difficult to start your own small business now because of the insecurity. You know, most small businesses fail. They have very uncertain income for months or years. Um, so without that foundation, people can't choose how to spend their lives. And it's giving people that option um, now. So the assumption is, you know, that most people will continue, of working age, will continue to do something that brings, that aims to bring in some form of income. And, you know, I, I do have a, a, um, a thought on this that, you know, I will confess that in a, in a um, basic income society, you will get an awful lot of bad poetry written. Um, but bad poetry has, you know, um, one advantage, it's very low carbon footprint because no one wants to read it, so you don't even need to print it. And, you know, if you're writing poetry that no one's interested in, probably after a couple of years, you'll give up that and go and do something else. But what you would also get is, of course, some wonderful poetry written that isn't written now because the person who might have written it is slogging away for 40 hours a week in, in a horrible call center and is so beaten down that there's no way they could possibly do that in their spare time. Um, pictures painted, small businesses started, so many different things. It starts to look very different as a society. And you don't want to make the, um, the basic income for artists conditional on their producing good poetry because then somebody is going to have to decide whether it's good or not. Um, and I just remind people when James Joyce's Ulysses came to the United States, it was uh, banned as pornography. Um, and you know, decades later, it's one of the masterpieces of the 20th century. So you want to enable people to produce work that might be considered trash today, but turns out to be a classic. Absolutely. Yeah, bad poetry is one of the most important genres of poetry, surely. <laughs> um, fantastic. Yeah, I, I think on the, um, I mean, it's four, four and a half thousand pounds less that you'd have to earn through labour, I suppose, is, is for me, I, and the question, how can you convince people politically that it's a good idea? I guess that that would be an, an angle that I would, I'm keen to take, particularly for working adults. You know, you, that's what's that, maybe a, a day a week, half a day a week, you could have a, like, the shorter working week is a, is a different policy. Uh, you know, we want to be working towards that separately from a basic income with no reduction in pay. But um, if that isn't happening, you could say uh, your basic income would allow you to choose what you do with that half a day a week. And, and I think that um, that becomes quite a politically compelling argument for our, for our working age adults and for everyone else, it's, it's four and a half thousand pounds more than they would have had otherwise. Samuel, do you want to crack on? Have we got another question? Indeed, I do. Ken, Ken uh, raised a question earlier. I would like to bring Ken, if that's okay. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you great. Right. Um, if UBI is set at a living income level, then someone in work getting UBI plus a minimum wage is getting something in the region of twice as much as someone with unpaid work only getting UBI. Will this be perceived as fair? Thank you, Ken. Do we, Natalie, Michael, do you have? Michael. I think it's a really interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer it uh, because it's a question about how it will be perceived. Um, uh, I think um, people will do what they choose to do, and if it's something that's not paid, um, it may be something they want to do regardless of whether it's paid or not, and then they won't feel as bad about it as um, someone who expects to get remunerated and then is not. But maybe Natalie has more to say on this. 
Um, I mean, I, I think, sorry, I slightly missed the question. I lost, I lost some of the sound. I was hoping to pick it up. Um, could someone repeat the question? Yes, I, I can do that for you. Oh, sorry, Clea, should you join me today? Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, Ken, I'm gonna repeat Ken's question that he wrote on the, on the chat, so I, I won't miss words, I, miss, I won't misspeak his words. So he says, it seems to me that if UBI is set for a living income level, a person on minimum wage plus UBI is twice as well off as a full-time carer on UBI alone. This magnifies the gap between low paid employees and those doing training unpaid work. Will this be perceived as fair? Well, I think at the moment you have a situation where a pair of carers, certainly in the UK family carers, are paid an astonishingly small amount of money, you know, far, than, far less than is enough to live on. Um, what I know about the US, and Michael may have more to, more to say about this, you know, many people in caring roles will not be having any income at all. Um, and so therefore, um, what you have as a situation is, you know, what that person is doing, as Michael said, is, is choosing to use their life in a certain way. It's not remuneration in money terms, um, but it's what they feel like, you know, they're meeting their, their responsibilities, they're caring for someone they love, whatever the, 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 it is, you know, the, there are non-monetary re rewards to that. And I think, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I cannot, I find it very hard to imagine a situation if you just had um, a society where everyone gets a certain amount of money. You know, I see UBI as in some ways decoupling, um, well, to use her, her, her Hannah Arendt's terms, um, you know, there's labor and there's work, and there's things you do because they need, they need doing and you're rewarded and there's things you do for money. Uh, people can actually move more towards doing the things you do for love. Um, and that is, um, you know, have to do less of the things you just do for money. And so it's rebalancing society. So it's actually giving people who want to be carers you know, more opportunities. They'd be better off now as, you know, a parent who chooses to stay at home and spend time caring for their child rather than going out to work. At the moment, you know, they have essentially no income at all. So you're rebalancing that and you're moving towards a society with kind of different kinds of choices. Thank you, Michael. I could bring in, into this the, uh, some years back, uh, there was a movement for wages for housework. Um, and the problem, if you take the idea literally, is that uh, you would be bringing um, home care work into the domain of either the market economy or the bureaucratic supervision of the state, uh, neither one of which is very attractive. You don't want people monitoring whether the person at the home is making good meals, whether they're doing proper care for their children and so on. Uh, and so basic income is a way of acknowledging that this is important work. It needs to be recognized. It re needs to be remunerated. It needs to be done in conditions where the carer is not economically dependent on a wage earner without commodifying it or making it subject to bureaucratic supervision. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Well, and I think, unfortunately, at the moment, we seem to care very little about how fairly we treat people doing unpaid care in our society. So, uh, yeah, while it might not be perceived or experienced as fair by, by carers, I, I don't know if that's something that will be a political derailer of, of the UBI argument. But I do think, um, I think it's something that needs to be acknowledged within other benefits as well, like carers allowance in this in the UK is, is completely insufficient. It's absurdly conditional. You can't work more than 16 hours a week paid uh, work, even if you, and you have to work 35 hours or more um, as an unpaid carer. Um, and, and so I suppose considering where the care that the person is doing fits in the kind of life cycle of care that we do, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult with a disability or you know, how long, how much their ability to engage with paid work is uh, affected by the care that they're doing. We should be building additional systems for, for financial support um, based on that is, is my, my opinion on that one. Uh, Samuel, you've got our final question teed up, have you? I do. The, the last final question, um, I've, gonna, I've, I've looked at Nick Landridge's question, um, and I'm going to try to uh, just be quite precise about it. Um, I think there's some of the questions he kind of raised is kind of, we've kind of pretty much sort of discussed it. Um, but um, 
he he brings up a point that you know uh, make sure that basic income is implemented in a way that is compatible with degrowth well-being economic principles that obviously Michael and Nasty are advocating, but it's not as a means to stimulate green growth through increasing employment incentives. Um, he says the latter is not only more attractive to current politicians, but also the focus of the majority of, of current trials. I feared that focusing on basic income as a silver bullet could lead to negative consequences if not implemented the right way. With the right complementary policies, how do we make this politically feasible? So it's if we get this done, how do we do this done right the first time round? I think it's what the seed the theme is what Nick has raised there. It's a good closing question. We'll go with the biggest conceptualist question. You've got about 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I think I hopefully I've already stressed that I don't regard UBI as a, as a silver bullet. It's part of a whole package of things. Um, and you know, I talked about making you know externalized costs appearing on the price tag. Um, you know, that's carbon taxes, but it's also things like water footprints and, you know, ensuring that decent labour conditions in all, in all levels of production. All, you know, there's a whole range of things. Um, I, there's one something else that I, I just want to mention in the, in the climate context, and it's something I've really only started to think about in the last day or two, um, which is we have a huge problem in, in the UK and I think in the US with austerity having seen slashing back of government services. And one of the problems we have is the capacity of the government to deal with the climate crisis with, with a hollowed out civil service without the kind of structures, all the privatization that's gone on. And one of the things you do is if you have a basic income, you're transferring resources into the community, giving it to people. And that's where, you know, a local community group that says we really want to tackle um, the carbon emissions in this area and you know go out and do a whole lot of draft proofing or something. Um, and we're all going to get together and do this and pull our UBI to do this what you've got is a situation where the state is essentially part through UBI, part funding things, but it just no longer has the capacity to deliver itself. So that's a, a quite new and closing thought. Yeah, I guess I would also stress that it's important to, um, when people emphasize green growth, and the creation of jobs um, to uh, raise critical questions about um, the necessity for economic growth, uh, relying too heavily on GDP as a measure of well being, to try to steer the conversation toward more adequate measures of well being that don't tie us to uh, forms of growth that are environmentally destructive. Um, and just try to broaden the conversation so that we're uh, attending to what we're doing to our environment, to future generations, and to other species, um, and not just the short-term um, goal of maintaining incomes and creating jobs. Thank you very much. Well, a massive thank you to our two speakers tonight and to everyone that posed a question was brave enough to join in our experiment of trying out uh, speaking up. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, we'll send around the recording of this video of this uh, event when um, when it's ready, <laughs> probably towards the end of the week. And do keep an eye on your emails tomorrow. We've got a very exciting project launching tomorrow. Um, so I'm really excited to share that with you. So keep your eyes peeled for, for an email from us. And uh, we'll hopefully see you again at the next next research network seminar.